Hello and welcome back to another episode here at The View from the Bullens. And it is, of course, the fans' view of myself, Ben Wynn Stanley, joined by Lee McLean and special guest Dan Osborne, one of our patrons' finest, has joined us today for the fans' view episode. Dan, thanks for joining us for this one. No worries. Good to be here, lads. Love the studio. It's looking smart. <laughs> Cheers, mate. And obviously, Lee, we're going to start off by talking about Everton's break. Do we have to? It, unfortunately, we do. Okay. It feels very reminiscent of when... We had that period away at the World Cup when Frank Lampard was here. We've had a three-week break now to try and relax, try and reset. What, what do you make of this? Are you happy that we've got no Everton? Are you happy that this break's come at the right time? Yeah, I am happy that we've got no Everton. It was just getting to the point where I think everyone was just getting a little bit to the end of the tether and fed up with what was going on. I think fans, players, manager included, all desperately needed this break. Obviously, a terrific run. Is it 1-11 that we've won? or no, no wins in 11. I can't even remember because I've switched off that much since the other day. Um, but I think we could have just gone on forever and probably carried on repeating the same pattern. I think frustration was starting to creep in, especially if you look at Dyche's interview after the, the last game. I think the tone changed. I think his frustrations started to become more apparent with the issue that's been plaguing us for, for weeks, which is decent performances in the main. There have been some poor ones in the mix there as well, but decent performances let down by awful awful finishing so we said on the podcast preceding the break that we hope Everton use these three weeks wisely get a change of scenery go away hopefully work on finishing it's funny yesterday seeing all the clips of Michael Keane banging them in and people saying he's, he's the answer at this point I don't even know whether to laugh or take it serious I've got no idea um, but I think we all just needed to, to, to reset I think there's going to be a renewed energy when we come back um, I do believe there's some plans afoot behind the scenes with, with the fan groups um, to do what they can, to do what they've done so well in, in recent years. And certainly the players just needed taken away and that confidence restoring. So I think it's just as important that the Everton manager, coach and staff, everyone behind the scenes does a lot of work off that training field in Portugal and when they get back on the psychological aspect of these Everton players. Try and get them to remember and instil that belief that they are good players. They've been good players in the past. They can finish. You know, there's players in there in, in attacking positions who can score goals and have scored goals. Do what they can to really build that confidence up because it's pivotal. We've now got a run, an uninterrupted run between now and the end of the season when they come back. And there are some just massive monumental games in there around the t with the teams around us, which are going to be, ultimately, they're going to decide our, our future. So, yeah, glad for the break. And personally, I am as well. Yeah, I think we did need the break, but I wasn't surprised to see Michael Keane banging in worldies, to be fair, <laughs> on social media. Dan, same question to you. Are you glad for the break? Are you going to miss Everton? Or are you happy to have your three weeks off and go on your stag dude tomorrow? I was going to say, I'm <laughs> definitely looking forward to that. And, um, yeah, that break is probably what we needed. I think it's come at the perfect time, to be honest. Um, I think the change of scenery, I think Daish actually said in his interview um, that he's happy to, you know, the rain even in this in this country at the moment, just to have a bit of warm weather for him. That's just going to get the lads going a bit. Um, looks like as well, that looking at Ian Wowen's on about crashing the box and emphasising about getting in the box and maybe a change of system we may see um, and just a bit more of confidence boost for the lads. Calvert-Lewin looks sharp all of a sudden. Um, <laughs> just it's amazing what a bit of a change, a change of scenery could maybe do. Um, we have, I think we've got the biggest break out of everyone now in the league and like I said yeah I think it's come at the perfect time for us to be honest yeah I, I agree I think it's quite important now that there's obviously a bit of nervousness amongst the fan base um, the managers the, the, the players the fans we're all seem to be very much on edge I think Goodison Park's been very nervy of late uh, I feel like it's been a bit flat probably the worst it's been in a long time you know the style of play, the players not scoring goals, not being entertained as such. And the, the players and that aren't giving us anything to feed off, I don't think. Um, you know, is it a mentality thing? Is it a confidence thing? I really don't know. I don't know what the answers are. Sean Dice has obviously paid handsomely to find these solutions. But I've always said, can you polish a turd? I'd probably argue no. Um, you, we've got to just ultimately just stay up this season, given any physical means possible. We had a good spell, didn't we? Four wins. Uh, back to back after we found out about that points deduction maybe they need this break to go away find some solutions as you quite rightly said Danny and Wone has said that we need to start flooding the box um, I feel if you watch Everton attack it seems very lethargic it seems very half-arsed it seems very as Dice alluded to why aren't you running into the box looking to score a goal in the Gladys Street 
why aren't we trying to score a goal? That that feeling, that euphoria of putting the ball in the back of the net, why aren't we trying to do that more? You know, it's it's a collective responsibility and I'm not going to come here as a big Daesh fanboy and say, you know, it's all on the players when it absolutely is not all on the players. This is years of mismanagement. This is years of misrecruitment. This is years of, you know, continuous cycle of managers coming in, coming out. And ultimately, they've got to find a way collectively because we've got to remain in the Premier League. And on to that next topic, Lee, one win in 16 is is the is the obviously the stat. Um, not good, not good whatsoever. There's a lot of social media. There seems to be a bit of a split in the fan base at the moment. This, especially after that Manchester United loss, which to be fair, none of us would have put that down as a win before the season even kicked off. Um, but it seems after that United loss, a lot of fans are starting to to question Sean Dice, which is you know football's all about opinions. Everyone's got the right to hold their own. What, what are your thoughts on it then? Dice in, dice out. Do you think he's got to improve? Do we think we need to get rid of in the summer? What, what do you think? It's such a hard question given everything that's in play. If Everton were a normal football club, which I wish we were, but we're not at the end of the day, um, the answer to this would probably be a little bit easier because any time you go one win in 16 at a club the size of Everton, then regardless, questions are going to be asked from certain quarters. You've got to remember Nil Satis Nisi Optimum still exists and we should, shouldn't should forget that just because we've been absolutely crap for the last three years. Well, longer than that, but especially the last three years have been awful, haven't they? So you, you can't go on this run of form and it's not a blip without everyone involved taking a portion of accountability. And I just think even you look at the Palace, the, the one that's sticking out for me and a lot of other people, and I think where the tide changed for a lot of people was that Palace game at home, for Everton to win that game. Palace are, are awful anyway but they had the four best players out on the day. We was we had players coming back. It was a home game and it was like, go and attack it and just go and win it. It's 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 one of them where pretty much every other team in the Premier League turns up that day and just swats Palace aside, no problem, 2-0 or whatever. But what we saw was a, a really defensive, lethargic, slow, sort of passive display. The, obviously, individual selections didn't help. I think I get selecting Ashley Young at right back, got everyone's back up. I was in the pub before the game and it was like, what's he doing? What's he doing? And immediately, your frustration then goes towards the manager, even before a ball's kicked. And I think that translates into the ground and that's what we've been what we've been seeing of late. So, Dice has got to improve. He, he's got to, His in-game management is something that we've talked about uh, in great detail and on several occasions, he, he's got to do things better to to impact games and change games as they happen. So often he sets things up fine. We've just talked about an exception there in Crystal Palace, but more often than not, Dice sets the team up well and the team have conceded that. Tarkovsky came out and said that the other day. We look organised from a defensive point of view, we look solid. What we don't do well enough is capitalise on pressure and on territory and chances. We've, we've not been taking them. And once when you don't take them, that's where then the players have to take responsibility to get us over the line. But then when they're not taking chances, it then loops back to Sean Dyche because if we get to 60, 70 minutes and we haven't and it's nil-nil, how can they, he then impact it? We've seen players of late who have looked completely dead on the feet and he's been reluctant to, to change it or he's left it far, far too late, which again, pisses people off. So you go back to the last game against West Ham and it was a sucker punch. I don't think we deserve, particularly deserve to lose that, that day. But I think you could see again, players were tiring. West Ham score and make it 2-1 with a worldie. And then he decides to bring, I can't remember, it was a Dobbin and Chimiti. Chimiti. Chimiti, yeah. And people were like halfway out the ground and there was just again, murmurs of discontent. People quite angry saying, what are you doing this now for? If I'm Sean Dice there, I use my head. You're 2-1 down in, in stoppage time. Don't even make the change because it's just going to piss people off. Because people are just going to say, you should have done it 15, 20 minutes earlier. And I just think that's like common sense. Don't do it. Because what have you got to lose? <clears throat> so I don't know. For, for me, if I'm completely honest, I loved Sean Dyche when he came in. I remember vividly saying if he kept us up last season, it would be the best achievement since Moyes got us top four and a stick by that. Yeah. And we will be forever grateful to, for Sean Dyche for doing that. He's still working in tremendously difficult circumstances, don't forget. We're in a very turbulent um, period of Premier League football in general, where who do you get? So if we were to pull the, pull the plug on Sean Dyche now, who do you go and get? You're just probably going to make a, a problem worse. But then if you were to ask me honestly, do you want Sean Dyche leading us into Bramley Moor? I would probably edge more on the side of no. 
and purely because from an Everton fan and Everton's history in general, this is probably the biggest chance Everton have got commercially everything to get things lined up and get it right and being as attractive as possible when we go into that amazing new stadium over the road. And I just don't think Sean Dyche, for me, fits that profile. And that, that's the style of play, everything included. But it doesn't mean he, he'll have done a bad job. He, he'll have served a purpose and he'll have done well for Everton while he's been here. So I'm still grateful for that. But he's got a job to do and between now and the end of the season. He's got to look himself, learn from his mistakes and then hopefully trust his players to do their bit as well. Yeah, definitely. Obviously, 18 months left on his contract due to finish at the end of the 24-25 season, which is the last year at Goodison Park. Um, Dan, I'll bring you back in now. Sean Dice won winning 16. Um, Lee would like a change before Bramley Moore Dock. What, what, what's your views on it? Do you think he's under pressure now? Do you think we should get rid of him in the summer? Do you think we should get rid of him in 18 months' time? What, what's your thoughts on it? I don't think we can do, can we? As Lee said there, there's no one else at the moment. Um, one thing, if you look at the start of this season and where we were when we were with Lampard, wasn't a fit team, was it? It wouldn't run. I remember the two games of Bournemouth and it got really hostile. It was horrible. Um, one thing he's done is brought a lot of fitness into the team. He's got a foundation there, clean sheets. Um, and we're picking up points where in the past we would have we would have just lost. We would have fell out down 3-4-0. Again, on the other side, it seems we've lost any sort of potency going forward. To be honest, I think the way the build-up, that Palace game stands out again. Yeah, I felt the way they were... Um, just lumping it forward. I think Derek Manfield said it every time we started. When Pickford, Tarkowski, and then he's lumped forward. Mm. You look earlier on in the season, we play through the midfield. We will not bypass the midfield as much. We, you know, try and break the lines a bit more. And it, we just seem to have lost that totally. And it's showing more and more. We get well, as soon as we get stretched, we fall to bits and we can't find a way back into a game. Um, I mean. Like I said, he's had no real backing. Um, he's, he's had a tough hand. Um, next year is going to be the big one, I suppose. I, I can't see him leaving anytime soon. I think he will be there next year. And you know, whether we do get a bit of financial income from Onana or Bramthwaite getting a sale, see what he can do with that between him and Kevin Farwell, see if we can get some good replacements if we do sell either of them too, because it's looking more and more likely like we might well have to. Yeah, <laughs> Look, for, for me, it's difficult. Obviously, he's got this 18-month contract. I think he should see out his 18 months. Um, I wouldn't want to change it again in the summer, even under new ownership. I think it would be more reactionary. Why have Everton had 10 managers in 11 years? It would then be. It's just absolutely chaotic. Um, Paddy Boyden's done an interesting article today in The Athletic, which speaks about, obviously, the underlying metrics, the data and the stats. And I get it. The result is the most important stat or metric out there. I understand but under Frank Lampard, all the data suggested that Everton were 20th, conceded the most chances, conceded the most shots, conceded everything. Um, and if it was only a case of the exceptional work of Tarkovsky and Jordan Pickford earlier on in the season that we didn't go on and we weren't sitting on zero points, not 15 points after 20. Now, the, this, this run we're on is completely unacceptable. It's got to be questions and questions simply have to be asked. I spoke recently... Um, with my mates, you know, in the pub, having a little chat about those around us. And we broke down that run that we've been on since we beat Burnley away uh, at Turf Moor. And ultimately, I've gone through the fixtures, and that Crystal Palace one, as you've both quite rightly said, is the one that stood out for me. You've got to be winning that game. You know, it, others involved are your Man City's twice, Tottenham Hotspur twice, Aston Villa, even Wolves away. Their attacking threat is far superior to ours. I've said it to my mates, and I'll come to you too as well to bring you in on this. I think the only teams we're better than in the Premier League is Sheffield United, Burnley, Luton, Nottingham Forest. I'd say we're probably better than them. Uh, and I also mentioned Crystal Palace. Um, you know, with Eze, Elise, superstars, they're both quality. Elise's hardly been there this season. Eze's been injured out for, for a while. So they, they've got match winners. You look around at the other teams around us, Brentford, they didn't have Ivan Tony for four or five months, another match winner who can win a game single-handedly. Probably borderline with us, I'd have them in and amongst us. But apart from that, I can't really see any. I think Fulham are probably a stretch ahead of us at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, Bournemouth, 
maybe they should be even more in the mix. They seem to have found a bit of form. But we haven't really played these teams around us and bar Crystal Palace. And I understand people's frustrations. And for me, a large proportion of this blame has to be on the players. The data is still saying that Everton should be scoring more goals. We've missed the most key chances in the league. We're, fo- we're underperforming by 14 or 15 goals now. Dominic Carvert-Lewin, carrying it to Barn Door. Beto, yeah, he's putting a few good performances. Hasn't hit, the, hasn't hit the ground running. Dwight McNeil, no fault of his own. He's got a lot of off-the-field issues. Dan Juma's now picked up an injury. Lewis Dobbin isn't ready. You know, if we're all going to be honest, he probably isn't ready. Yes, he should be coming on a lot more. You know, the substitutions with Sean Dice are a big problem. Game management, completely agree, Lee. Probably my one side that I, I agree to say, like, it is, it's it's not very good. Like you quite rightly said, that a few podcasts are, podcast ago, minute nought to, to 60, we're very much in games and we should be leading. And then after that 60 to 80 minute bracket, we're conceding and then we're conceding within the 90th minute as well. So it, it is difficult. Yes, it is under immense... These are very unique set of circumstances Sean Dice finds himself in for me. I do have a bit of sentiment towards him. You know, no balls. machiri has gone completely AWOL. We've had six, six points deductions, 10 reduced to six which would find us now in 13th position and we'd be sat here now going, oh yeah, we'll enjoy the break. Three points when we come back, we'll ultimately be safe. Um, so I do feel like the job he's, do- he's doing is probably, you know, six and a half, seven out of 10. That- that's what I'd be scoring him. I do think he deserves to see out his contract. Who knows, maybe we may sell Onana, Blanc, for and we'll probably get onto that shortly, the next topic, to fund the recruitment We've also got to look at potentially Kevin Felwell and all this. Again, I understand the scrutiny that's happened above. Everton are selling the most creative players over the past few seasons. Whether you liked Alex Awobi or not, Alex Awobi created chances from open play. He was that player that linked between the lines. And I understand the frustration from Evertonians that they say, I watch football with my eyes and I get it on the eyes. He wasn't didn't rip up, but he always seemed to create chances. Damari Gray again had to be sold. Alex Awobi, Anthony Golden, Richarlison. There's a theme here that if you continue to sell your best players and sell your creativity and replace them with, let's get it right, Dwight McNeil got relegated with Burnley. Jack Allison got relegated with Leeds. Dan Juma didn't really do much at, uh, at Tottenham. Fell out with Villarreal. Beto, we got him on a free transfer basically for 12 months. Speaks volumes, doesn't it, to me? Dominic Carvert-Lewin, Carner to Barn Door. So, for me, I feel like we just need to try and be a bit more realistic. I feel like the players aren't performing to the best of their capabilities. We're creating the chances. But we just can't... You can't coach or manage someone like Ben Godfrey doing what he did to Garnacho in, in, in the 36th minute. You can't... That, that is not a managerial issue for me. It's on the players. And I, and I bring James Tarkovsky into that as well. Everett were on top for 10 minutes looking comfortable, and the captain on the day does that, and I've called him out for that. I don't think it's very acceptable whatsoever. So what do I do after his 18 months? Who knows? I'd like to see how we get on over the next 18 months. I think Everton fans have just had so much negative turmoil for the past three years that, quite frankly, people are saying, why why should I be bothered again? I've done my bit for the past two years, and I understand it completely. Um, but unfortunately, we've got a job to do, as Lee quite rightly said again. There's this stuff behind the scenes getting done to make Burnley probably the best atmosphere in regards to flags, banners, stuff that we will ever see, mosaic, stuff like that. Not to get too much out the bag, but it's going to be very special on that day. Um, moving on from that, we'll touch on the summer window then. Obviously, the fans' view is to get a different opinions. Obviously, Lee and Dan, Onana, Bramthwaite. You know, who else? Who do you think then, Lee? Saleable assets, how much you'd like to get, and then realistically, what you think. This year, I can't emphasise this enough, is an absolute massive rebuild. Mm -hmm. Contracts are up, players leaving on loan. Mm -hmm. What would you do? It's tough, isn't it? I think you guys spoke on on a podcast recently about us having, did you say four main saleable assets? So Anana, Pickford... Branthwaite, Calvert Lewin with a day for yeah, them four. That's what I said, yeah. And then when I came in to the studio after you'd wrapped up, um, I think I pitched in and said if it was the two, if it was two and I had to pick two out of them, it'd be Onana and Calvert Lewin. Um it, with Branthwaite, that would sting that. Yeah. I just can't bear the thought of losing Branthwaite. It would take me back to the time when I was sat in food tech, aged fourteen, and I found out Duncan Ferguson was leaving and I ended up like tears going down my face <laughs> and all that. It was horrible. 
Um, Rooney, that was grim as well when, when he left for Man United. It would sting. John Stones was a bad one because you, you knew we had a proper player there yeah. and we ended up losing him after a little bit of a fight to try and keep him. Branthwaite's such a special footballer. Um, he's going to go right to the very top. And it, it is just a shame that we find ourselves in this position financially with the, the turmoil that's going on and everyone nervous in the market. Like if you go back two years, you're asking for you're asking for nine figures for Branthwaite. Because um, if you look around the world of football now, name me a better up and coming centre back than, than him, who, who, who's as rounded and have got the attributes as he has. He just looked comfortable in every single position, stood out like a sore thumb against Man United yeah. as well. So I'd be loath to lose him, but if we did answer the question, I'd be wanting north of seventy-five million for him. And I would hold firm on that, despite the circumstances that are around the Premier League at the minute. Because I think if we were to be offered less than that, I'd then revert to other saleable assets. And I'd look at Anana, who is a, is a good player. We'd miss him when he's not there. But for me, he doesn't impact games as much as he should. Um, I don't think he brings his quality to the table as consistently as a player of his standard should. I don't think he stamps his authority on games, grabs them by the scruff of the neck, the way you used to see the likes of Steven Gerrard do for the other lot. Never see that from him, unfortunately. And in key moments, he's let himself down as well. Um, but he's one of them where you just know he was to make the move to a, a, a bigger club with really good players around him. He's just going to excel and become an absolute beast. You just know it's going to happen. Um, but I think sensibly speaking, if Everton were to be able to get, I don't know, 50, 60 million for Anana, we'd be doing very, very well. And that would enable us, again, in the, in the environment that we're in, could we reinvest that in two, three, you know, really good, solid players we talked about and be dipping back into the championship again, like we did under Moyes, and we plucked the, the best player from the championship for like three seasons running and built a really solid, you know, we look at Leighton Baines, Les Scott, Jaggy Elka, Tim Cale, maybe follow that model. We missed the boat with Guy Carez because we probably weren't in the position to act. So it's a tough one. Um, Calvert-Lewin, what does he command now after the season like he's had? You know, what, what what's that done to his market value? Um, and, you know, how appealing he is to potential suitors in the Premier League. You could only be looking for maybe 15, 20 million for someone like Dominic Calvert-Lewin. But then can you reinvest that in someone who's maybe proven at a different level or in Europe, you know, relying on better scouting, et cetera. So... It's tough. Pickford, don't want to lose him. And I think he, he seems happy at Everton. Uh, he'll have had multiple opportunities to leave in the last few years. I think he's happy in the North West. Um, he's approaching 30 now, I believe. I, I think he must be around that age, 28, 29, 30. or 30. <laughs> um, where, where the goalkeepers meant to have the best the best years. But we could have no complaints if Jordan Pickford said, listen, I've, I've given Everton you know, so many years of really good service. I could have left... You know, at, at the drop of a hat, really, at any at any point in the last few years, but I haven't. Um, but I'll, I'm looking at the the top sides and who he could go to, especially in the Premier League, and they've all got really good keepers in place anyway. United was the one wearing it last year. Before yeah, got I think he's missed that. Yeah, because that was, was Northwest yeah. as well. It wouldn't have took much upheaval and yeah. stuff. So maybe Jordan Pickford stays. So if it's a, if, it, if if I had to choose one or two, it'd be an Arden and Calvert Lewin, and just squeeze the most out of them too. Dan, I'll come to you then. Similar, well, exactly the same question. Yeah. Who would you then, because this is a big rebuild this year. Um, I think obviously Coleman, I think he's kind of said his body's done. I think we're going to mm -hmm. probably expect that news towards the end of the year. Um, <clears throat> Adrisa Garnagay, his contract's up. I think there's an option for, to extend it by a year if the club wants to. But again, he's pushing that age, big wages. Gomez is then leaving. Delhi's leaving. Ashley Young's contract's up. Um, there's, a, there's a few players leaving the club. I think we end up with 14 outfield players, potentially. This is a massive, monumental year now. Who do you think then would, would probably go? You know, Who would demand the fee? Branthwaite, Onana. I, th I agree with Lee. They're probably the four saleable assets. I think Pickford, I agree. I think he's going nowhere. Um, I think I agree with that once again in regards to... You look around... Everyone seems to have got their cemented number one or spent big on their can't number one. Can't see him going abroad, can you? No, you just can't. <laughs> can't he won't get the it. rave on in Spain, will he? Nah, but nah. <laughs> <laughs> what are your thoughts on that topic then? What, what do you think? Yeah, I think the one is it's Onana. I really wouldn't like Bramthwaite to go. I think if we had the luxury, which we know we haven't, we'd keep him for at least one more year, see if he gets to the England squad for the European Championships, and then look at moving on maybe next year. Um, Obviously, we're in a situation where we need the money and we need to rebuild a lot of positions. 
Oh no, no. Um, and then you're, you're struggling. Then, like you say, sell, sellable assets. Do you get a bit of money from a Patterson or something like that? It's, it's not going to be much, though, is it? He's not shown a lot, but he's not getting a chance to show. If he has got anything, you can only hope that if he does something well with Scotland and the European Championships, maybe he gets a five, ten million, and then you reinvest that with another Championship player again. Um, oh no, no. I'd be looking at fifty plus at least. Otherwise, because I think we've got. We've got to give Lille some money, haven't we? Out of yeah, the, the deal as well. So, yeah. um, it's it's hard, isn't it? I think the the way to look at it is like you said with Moyes and other teams are doing it now. The you know, um, he's like Wharton, is it? He's gone to Crystal Palace. Good player from Blackburn. Um, we watched him for years as well. Yeah, there's 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 players there in the Championship. There's definitely players there because teams have gone there more and more times recently, and they've, they've flourished. Um. But yeah, it's it again. Where do you get that finance from? And the only two that I can think of is, like you say, Pickford. Can't see him going anywhere. And the only two I can think of is Onana and Bramfweight. Bramfweight. If I'm honest, I'd be looking at ninety at least for him. No, I would. You five year, you signed a five year deal. He's about to get. He's about to break into the England team, and I think once he does, he's just he's not going to look back. To be honest, so I'd be looking at at least ninety for Bramfweight. Um, and then, yeah. It might have to be two, though, mightn't it? When you speak about, and you've just said that then, about 14 fifth players. You're going to need 10, aren't you? Or eight? Yeah. You're going to need eight. 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 Yeah. So eight, eight doesn't go into 50 million. If you get or 60 for an honor, eight doesn't go into that. You're not getting much for that, are you? No, and the only other one, Dom. 15, 20 for Dom. So it might have to be two. You just don't know. It doesn't bear thinking about, does it? Massive job. I think what I want to touch on on this subject is I would never forgive the owner, the previous owners, the previous boards for us even having to discuss selling our best players. Um, it's just a whole grim situation that we're even having to speak about it. For me, deep down, I think Jared Blanthwaite's probably the young, best upcoming centre-half in Europe. Mm -hmm. um, absolutely exceptional talent. Other clubs and other fans don't realise just how good he is. Uh, I've seen a few fan accounts laugh at the, the, the prospect of demanding £100 million. I think if Everton's finances were in tip-top shape, I agree with you, Dan. I'd be demanding £90 million plus and saying, you pay it or he doesn't go anywhere. He's just signed a new five-year deal. The problem we've got is, is I've said for a while now, I think a player will have to be sold before June the 30th because of this ongoing issue surrounding the stadium interest rates of the Premier League are refusing to accept, even though they changed the goalposts halfway through. Everton's losses will continue to grow, and I think we need a minimum £20, £30 million pound of full profit to even avoid a possible charge the following year, even though it's changed in August, and that's a whole different podcast altogether. It's a disgrace. Um, but ultimately, we know how this works. For Everton will probably be demanding £75, £80 million, pounds other clubs around the world will be trying to low ball us and you probably meet in the middle I think being a realistic you know taking off with blue tinted glasses and blue cap I think Everton will be snatching your hands off for 65 million plus add-ons and it's horrible to say it's sickening um, given the finances where we currently are we're probably having to undersell players Onana for me you got to go off the, the Roman Lavia transfers and the Saicedo to Chelsea yes top bowl he spent like an absolute lunatic um, but I just find, you know, Arsenal, I've said it all along, Arsenal are going to be the ones coming in hard from Adon Onana. Talks, there's already been talks with him, with his sister, I think it was his agent, who have been heavily involved in, in her area um, to get to, to Amadou Onana. You know, that news will probably break in a few weeks. Um, again, £60 million. Pounds. We've spent, I think it's, we've paid Lille £16 million pounds so far for the £28 million pound fee. Um, and there is a 20% sell-on clause. Now, I'm unsure if that's 20% of the whole value or 20% of any profit above the £28 million. So it's either going to be £6 um, or £12 million we'd have to give back to Leo, depending on what that clause actually says. So for me, Onana is probably certainly going. I think he'll be the one definitely to go. Bramthwaite, again, I'd absolutely hate for him to go. I'd love to see him get another 12 months development. But it's just sicker, isn't it? The way that we can't, you know, we can't be pushing for Europe. We can't be saying to Jared Bramfrey, we're going to offer you the chance to walk out, probably as captain at Bramley Moor Dock. You know, Tarkovsky's got another year left on his deal. Coleman, 
as we quite as we said earlier, is he going to be looking to hang up his boots this year? It's going to be exceptionally difficult. And Leah, I agree with you. It's going to be eight to ten players. This is people have looked back on previous years and gone, oh no, rebuild, rebuild. This is the summer, and I'm I'm not as scared yet about this season staying up. I'm more scared about next year because you're looking at your Leicester. They're probably going to come up. Leeds, Southampton, maybe West Brom. The Premier League next year is going to be incredibly difficult to stay up in, and that's what I'm worried about. And we're now going to be throwing probably eight players, as you quite rightly said, eight to ten players into a new squad. And this is going to be a, a new brand, a new version of Everton. And people have said you trust Kev Farewell to, to sort that out, given the record on recruitment. You saw Sean Dyche on regards to the coaching. I'm I'm not a man, I'm not Mystic Meg. I can't I can't give you them answers right now. All I can say is defensively we look a lot better and we are creating more chances, but we cannot score. And Lee, you're absolutely right again. Given that missed opportunity with Giocanez last year, I, I, we'd be top eight now. If we'd signed a goal scorer in the summer, we'd be top eight, and I'll, I'll stand by that. Mm-hmm. Someone who can actually put the ball on the back of the net. And on that note, we've got him with a brief fee. Mm. Do you take up the purchase or do you leave him? Um, it obviously a lot depends on the fee. Um, you probably know more than me in terms of what Leeds are asking for, but it's one of them. Has he just been dragged down by others and the form of everyone else around him? Um He's also, don't forget, that there's a very, very problematic right-back position at Everton right behind him. And, that, and, and I think that's a fair you know, mitigation when, you, when you're talking about Jack Harrison. Um, if he was to have like a really good... Like a, a, a Seamus Coleman in his prime behind Jack Harrison, you'd see a better Jack Harrison. That's just a fact. Um, you, know, you look at right-backs and right, right-wingers and left-backs left, left backs and left-wingers, the best ones, that they perform in, in combinations. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I don't know he, he has flattered to deceive his crossing of late Dominic Calvert-Lewin must be tearing his, his hair out at the, the quality of delivery from Jack Harrison he, he hits the first man far far too often he's got to be working on that but I mean he showed so much promise and quality especially at Leeds some of the goals and assists that he used to throw in and you're like where's that yeah. where's that gone obviously we've seen the great goal against Bournemouth at Goodison and anything and he's going to build on that not not quite seeing it. Uh, I think again he's just someone who's who's really low on confidence at the minute. Um and a hundred percent Jack Harrison playing at the top of his ability, you would. You'd take on the option. Definitely, if the price is right. The other three that you've just mentioned there, I think Seamus Coleman, it is time now to to probably say goodbye to that one and thank Seamus for his contribution and is absolute unbelievable service to this football club during such a difficult period as well. He doesn't know as anything. He can look back at, at himself in the mirror. He's not let anyone down. Um, but ultimately, age and injuries, especially injuries at the extent that he's suffered, catch up with anyone uh, at the end of the day. Um, Ashley Young, no. No, thanks. <laughs> Sorry. No. Um, I, I, I wasn't really for that signing to begin with. Um, I know we had a few strong debates about it at the start of the season and there was, you know, looking at his stats at that Villa and things like that. But no, everything about that deal to me screamed desperation and, you know, just, nah, no, 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 no. I just think he's one of them where if his name's on the team sheet half the ground get pissed off and I'm one of them. I have to, I've got to hold my hand up. <laughs> um, he's, he's too old. He's not very good anymore and we need to move on and, and look for other options. It's not worked. Um, but being a great pro, he has. He's been. He's had, he's had a great career, better than anything I could have ever done. And he, you know, we all look back and he's had a superb career. Um, and who's the other one you mentioned? Adrissa Gay. Keep yeah. him. Yeah, for a squad player, you know, if we need eight or ten players, Adrissa Gay can can do a job, especially maybe more off the bench this time around. But he can certainly fill a gap in a squad, and he's definitely worth keeping. I think Garner Gay's our best midfielder as well. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that's and again, I think Seamus Coburn's our best right back, and these are two middle-aged men now and that just shows you how poor the recruitment's been and Dan same to you especially Jack Harrison because it's a big talking point people are discussing Jack his performances haven't been good at all for a long time he does put 110% effort in he just it goes back to that Manchester United game He, he kicked out the pass and Jordan Pickford was screaming at Sean Dice saying get him off get him off and then Lewis Dobbin got screamed over he got stripped and he made a triple substitution so it, it, he's finding it difficult but I agree with Lee I think having Ben Godfrey behind you 
you know, probably telling to do press ups instead of doing anything else. <laughs> I, I'd be I'd be very worried to be honest because Gosh. I don't like Ben Godfrey whatsoever, uh, especially not at right back. I think that trial's well and truly over. But what are your thoughts on Jack Allison? The others mentioned. Uh, again, I don't agree with Lee. It depends on the price. Um, I think Dice likes him. I do. Otherwise, he wouldn't keep putting him out on that right side. He just, for me, doesn't offer enough going forward. He wants to cut on his left. And by the time he cuts on his left, he's got three defenders around him. And then he's isolated because, you know, like you say, you've got Godfrey, who's nowhere near him. I think, like I say, I think they will keep him. I think Dice does like him, like I said. I think he likes his work effort, the cover, he, he, he 110% all the time. <clears throat> and the situation we're in where we are looking at probably eight to ten players bringing in. So if you've got someone there and the price is of fair value, I think they'll end up keeping him, to be honest. Would you go higher than 16 million? No, no way. No. I think that's, we can afford two, can we? No. It's like you say, you've, how many sellable assets you've got? Two or three, how much money are you getting from that? And after you've paid, even for Brantford, I think we've got money to Carlisle, haven't we? Yeah, they, they've got some sort of sell-on fee as so, well, yeah. you know, you've got to make sure every penny, we've got to squeeze every penny out of this summer. Um, <clears throat> so the price, like you say, it needs to be at fair value and it needs to be fair to Everton. And if it's not, then walk away. You've got to, at some point, you've got to trust the recruitment. There's players, like we've said there in the Championship, likes of Tom Fellows, young lad yeah. coming. These are the sort of players we need to start looking at now. Mm. Um, not looking at Ashley Old <laughs> and relying on all these older players and giving them big contracts. We need to start looking at youth now and we need to start looking at players that are going to be sellable assets. Yeah, I agree. I think one player for me that stands out and the bobble's there is probably not, you know, knows I'm going to say, would be young Callum O'Hare down at Coventry. You know, he's had a contract in the summer, could play in that number 10 position, very creative. 25, yes, he had a couple of injuries in regards to his legs, but exceptional talent. I think he's come back since coming back from um, a ligament or hamstring issue, and I don't know if it's like eight goals and numerous assists. He's literally tearing it up. His con they've offered him a new deal. He hasn't signed it yet. Someone like that, if you're in Everton now and you're looking beginning to plan, you start getting at the ear of him and say, look, we can offer you 40, 50 grand a week here, and you'll be playing probably, because I think Decore is struggling as well yeah. behind mm -hmm. yeah. at the moment as well. I think um, he needs to come out. I think Decore is massively struggling since he's come back from his injury. I don't think he's been in that gap. I think his positive was scoring goals. Um, what I do with Jack Harrison, it's hard, isn't it? I wouldn't be paying anywhere above twelve million pounds, but I think I think they're going to ask between sixteen and twenty, and probably be the fee. Um, we've got to remember that Morpe has got an option, believes to be around eight to ten million. If he plays, I think it's another couple more games for Brentford. There's an appearance-related activation clause, um, which Brentford, I think, will probably take up on that because he's, you know, he scored, he scored a few things. He scored up more than well, all our Premier League strikers, strikers. Maybe not yet yeah. him, as we know. <laughs> so I think that they'll probably take up on that option, um, especially with Tony probably looking to leave them as well. Um, Jack Allison, yeah, he works hard. I think Sean Dice does like him. I think you're right, Dan. I think he does trust him quite a lot. Just need a bit more from him. You know, he's one of them players that so frustrating seems to look slower without the ball I don't know how that makes sense Dwight McNeil's the same mm -hmm. looks quicker with the ball um, and I just feel like it, it's very frustrating all we want is someone to put a ball into the box if you, if you work hard and if you're a winger and you put a good delivery no one will moan mm -hmm. <laughs> literally it's that easy to be a winger for Everton get mm -hmm. down the line pull it back on your left you know Andros Townsend probably your prime example yeah. you know wasn't that quick in the end putting a great ball for Luton uh, the other day at Crystal Palace, they obviously got the points. Someone like that, knock it back onto your left and just put a good delivery into the mix. Um, Seamus Coleman, I think you're right, I think it is time. Um, I think he's openly said, you know, he's fit again. He's been back for weeks. There's a reason he's not playing. I think his body's starting to tell him. I think Gary Neville alluded to it when he played West Bromwich Albion all them many moons ago. You just know. Mm -hmm. And I think we're at that stage now with Seamus Coleman, which is a shame because he's a model pro. Um and the next topic we're going to move on to is Bramley Moor Dock. Everton have had a recent shareholders meeting and it was alleged that there was 35,000 people on the season ticket waiting list, 18,000 being Tier 1 members. Bramley Moor, 52,000. Have we gone a bit below of where we should be? For me, 
I think we have. I think it should have been 60,000 minimum, but I'm looking at getting your views on it. Think Evan have undersold themselves, Lee? Uh, yeah. Yeah, because the mats don't, you do the mats and the mats don't work, do they? How many season ticket holders have we got now? Is it 31? Um, yeah, and, the, and the demand is there. I don't know why. We all must be absolutely off our head. Um, I, I'm surprised that there's three people on the waiting list, never mind 35,000. But that's just Everton fans for you. Um, so, you, you mean, you look at the numbers. You've got to leave a portion for for, for walk-ups. Not, not walk-ups, but, you, you know. You have to, yeah. c- For tickets, yeah, um, you know, for general sale. You have to leave a portion for that. But if you look at some of the other big clubs, I mean, that is a tiny portion that they've got. Yeah. Like a really small availability for general sale of uh, tickets. Um, and, yeah, I, it's one of them. Do, do you want the intimacy do you want it to be vast? Was there a fear that we weren't going to sell out? I mean, surely if, if anyone with a bit of common sense and who are, who are looking at the numbers in the background and the commercial positions at Evan can look at people, the numbers on waiting list and say, there's, there's no danger of us selling out Den- ever. Den- Denise was pushing 48,000, which was a massive well, worry and red flag for well, me. Well, no comment. <laughs> so let's just leave her where she belongs in the past. But even the away, so if you look at factor in the away support, and I'm not, I'm not sure what the minimum percentage you have to give to an away team is in, in the Premier League. But like a, even at sixty thousand, let's say it's ten percent. I think it's ten percent. Yeah, that'd Minimal. sell out. That'd sell out every week because it's a new stadium. It's very, very attractive. Um, it's good. Other f- away fans will be looking at the new stadium. Oh, yeah, I can't wait to go there. Yeah, like like the Tottenham. Yeah, I want to go there. It's the first time I've been to Evans' new stadium and all that, and it is unbelievable. Um, so yeah, we have sold ourselves short. I'd, I've not done enough research into the design of the stadium um, to to know whether we've got the option like City did. To like when they extended the Etihad, I think you can go up to fifty-five. I think off the top of me, yeah, because I know the north stands very limited because yeah. we're yeah. Like, we're landlocked by another dock, so that's why the north stand is the way it is with the seats only going uh, so oh, high. Yeah, yeah. So we can't we can't build on that. And then if you're building on any other sides of the grounds, does it then start to look a little bit like Anf- like crap, like Anfield? Um, so you don't know. It it we could have sold more, but it, at the end of the day, we haven't. Every game's going to be a sellout, and we've got probably the most world-class location for a stadium you'll ever f- you'll find anywhere on the planet so i'm grateful for that but it, yeah it is just a shame that we couldn't have gone a little bit bigger Sixty thousand would have been ideal for me i agree would you move in uh, as soon as it's done you know what i've changed my opinion on that i am very sentimental i'm an old school everton fan you know been going to the game now for 30 odd years i love goodison park um but it's starting to become it's like it's like it's a curse as, uh, as soon as we get the green light to go in Bramley Moor Dock, I would be running, throwing the keys behind me and saying, bulldozers, get in, knock it down and perform an exorcism now. <laughs> because I'm sure it's built on some sort of like ancient burial site for <laughs> pagans or whatever, I don't know. Um, so sentimentality out the window. We Commercial-wise, where Everton find ourselves now, it's such a perilous position. We've just talked about it in the last topic, just what a tough position Everton are in financially. We need to avoid getting in any further hot water. So for me, it would be a no-brainer. As soon as Bramley Moore is available to move in, we've got to capitalise on that financially. Yeah, I think the maths say something like we'd make an extra four, three or four million pounds a game mm-hmm. at the new grounds. Like that could be the difference. Those you know eight games from Christmas to the end of the season. You're talking that could be your, your twenty million pounds to prevent a further breach financially. Um, and that's before any like concerts, women's games, anything like that go into it. Dan, I'll ask you the same question. Do you think it's undersold in regards to capacity and would you move in? Absolutely. I, th- I think, again, it's the, one of the last things of the board, isn't it? The safe and little old Everton. And you need to be a bit more ambitious. 60, like you say, should have been at least what it is. At least. I think we've got the highest percentage of season ticket holders yeah. in the league compared to the capacity. Yeah, We sell out. Home and away have done for the past oh, I can't ever. Fair, ever. Mm. I, I, I think it's criminal. I do. I really think it's criminal. And again, it's in bad off the field decisions from Everton. Um, and we're just having to live with it now. I have to put up with it. Um, it's getting more money. It's being lost. Would you, would you move in straight yeah, away? Definitely. Get the dog in, get the sacrificial dog in, whatever you need, <laughs> just do it. Yeah. <laughs> get into the new stadium. <laughs> yeah. Honestly. Bless so, it, yeah. I think for me, I, I agree. You know, I've I tweeted about it, and you know, got a bit of a bit of pushback. You know, people's opinions change. People saying Goodison needs the right send off. Goodison Park has been an absolute misery ground for me. 
you know, I was four years of age when we last won the FA Cup. Anyone under yeah. my age, 40, yeah. can't yeah. remember yeah. any good I, times, really. No. You know, there's Kevin been... Mo- can, but we the, can't. The, the, yeah. <laughs> good point, Dan. The, there's, there's been moments where I thought I was, I was made up to be there. You know, Fiorentina, you know, the 2-0, the ground was rocking. Um, and I hate, I hate, I hate saying it. The Palace and Bournemouth games, you know, for the wrong reasons to say... Um, but apart from that, like I'm, I'm excited to see the back of it, so I can finally have a burger in the stands. To be honest, because they haven't got the certificates to flip a burger in the stands. That's why you get microwaved hot dogs, and you've got to make the best of that. Um, ultimately, Everton need to start being more ruthless. I agree, Dan. Start. I don't know why we undersell ourselves. I don't know why why we doubt ourselves. If you want to dance with the big boys, you've got to start thinking like the big boys. Unfortunately, Everton, are we unfortunately behind the likes of the, sh- the shite across the park? You know, sorry for swearing, but we probably are if we're going to be completely honest with ourselves. But we need to start taking it to the next next level. For those of you who've been to Tottenham's new ground, oh my it's god, unreal. it is it's absolutely incredible. And there's people in the football and world that's comparing Bramley Moor Docks to Tottenham's ground and saying that it's going to be just as good. I would have loved to have seen minimum of sixty thousand. I think. People were a bit worried, apparently, behind the scenes that there'd be a few empty seats. I, I don't think there'd be a few empty seats. If you put the more seats in, you could maybe reduce your season tickets by 100 quid, a couple of hundred quid, because we all know they're going to rock it as soon as we go up there. Um, and you've got to trust, again, trust what's behind you. You look behind the scenes. If they're saying, and, and they're, if the, Everton are saying there's 35,000 people on a waiting list, and that them stats are true, then what the hell are we doing selling at 52,000? Like, uh, yeah, it's going to be incredible regardless. And this is maybe me just nitpicking. I just want to see Everton go to that next level. You know, you look at like the best teams around and they've got this ruthless mentality and they don't care what happens. You know, sell Goodison Park, you know, get the money, invest in the team, make us this, this colossal giant to take us. Because ultimately, no matter who comes and goes, no matter what players come and go, Everton is why we're all here. We want to see Everton doing well. Again, Lee, I know you're very sentimental regards and regarding Goodison. Um, I've not seen anything. My dad would be gutted. My dad's seen everything. Uh, and I want that as an Everton fan now because it's just been a life full of misery for me, unfortunately. I must have done something in 91 when I was born and been born into a, a life of sadness and, and misery. But <laughs> there we have it, ladies and gents. Another fans view. Massive thanks to Dan and Lee for joining me for this one. As always, big thanks to our sponsors, Mike Keir with c and Demolition, and of course, Daryl at the Beer Keller. So go down to them if you ever go before a match or you're driving around town, pop in for a pizza, drop in for any sorts of drinks. We have got an event on Friday. There are very limited amounts of tickets remaining due to a few people falling down ill, or probably because they just hate Everton. I wouldn't blame them, to be honest. But in the meantime, have a great week and up to Sophie's. 